Hello, everybody. I see that there are people already congregating in this webinar. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski. I am a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center and the last one of the current academic year. It is a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. And today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Edgar Gomez Cruz is an associate professor at the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin. Facundo Suenzo, a doctoral student at Northwestern University and a coordinator of the Center for Latinx Digital Media will introduce Edgar in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and the Program in Latin and Latino Studies. Before we go into the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historic and, and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ko Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and institutions' history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Facundo will tell us more about Edgar's research and career in just a minute. Then Edgar will present his work. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of the screen at any point in time. Facundo will moderate. At the end, we Thank you very much, Pablo, and hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Edgar Gomez Cruz. Dr. Gomez Cruz holds the position of Associate Professor in the School of Information and serves as the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Texas at Austin. He earned his bachelor's honors in social communication from the University of Colima and went on to obtain a master's degree in social sciences, specializing in international communication and new technologies from the Instituto Tecnológico de Monterrey, both in Mexico. Continuing his academic pursuits, he completed a master's degree in sociology, sociological theory, knowledge and culture and communication at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid and a PhD in Information and Knowledge Society from Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. Professor Gomez Cruz's research interests encompass a wide range of topics, including digital culture, information, innovative methods, visual culture, new media ethnography, science and technology studies, critical theory, diversity, inclusion, social justice, and Latin America. His scholarly work has been recognized through numerous grants and scholarships resulting in the publication of four books, two edited volumes, over 20 book chapters, and more than 30 articles in index peer-reviewed journals. These publications span across 10 different countries and were written in four different languages. His most recent book, Vital Technologies, Thinking Digital Cultures from Latin America, published last year by Puerta Abierta, Universidad Panamericana, offers insightful reflections on the application of digital technologies in everyday life. According to the author, these technologies have become essential and therefore must be understood and studied as vital forms. Before we proceed, I would like to remind our audience to submit any questions you may have using the Q&A function on Zoom. We will address these questions following the presentation. 
We are truly privileged to have Dr. Gomez Cruz share his extensive knowledge and experience with us in this seminar. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Edgar Gomez Cruz. Thank you, Facundo, and thank you, uh, Pablo. Let me just share my screen and just give me a second because it's going to be a portion of the screen. Okay, so I just want to confirm that you are actually looking at my screen right now. Yes. That's just a portion of yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, hola a todas, todes y todos. I've been a massive fan of this series of talks and I deeply appreciate the invitation from Pablo and, and Facundo and Catalina to be part of it. Many dear friends and colleagues have uh, talked about their work here and I'm really happy to be able to join them in this collective conversation. I want to begin by acknowledging that I speak to you from Austin. I was going to be in my office, but unfortunately there's, there was a, um, an incident this morning uh, with some health incidents, so I'm, I'm in, my in my home. So I speak from you uh, from Austin that sits on indigenous lands. I want to acknowledge that I'm currently standing on the ancestral homelands of the, uh, of the Plains tribes, including the Lipan Apache, Comanche, Atoncawa. I acknowledge the systematic elimination and forced expulsion of the indigenous people of central Texas uh, enabled the society uh, of today to develop on these lands. Today, several indigenous peoples from all over the world uh, visit Austin and or call it home. I'm grateful to address you all from this, uh, from this piece of Turtle Island. And I invite all of you to name the original peoples of the place where you are in, in the chat. Before we delve into the heart uh, of today's discussion, I would like to address some elements that form the base of my talk. I believe these clarifications are essential components to the epistemic intervention I am to present today. These ingredients are intrinsically intertwined with my personal experience and the feminist and decolonial perspective I embrace. By situating my knowledge within the context of my own life, I hope to engage you in a meaningful dialogue about yours. So let me begin by stating that I will not be delivering the customary empirical paper commonly featured in this remarkable series. There are three reasons for this departure. First, uh, all of you are aware the COVID pandemic uh, significantly impacted our lives. While my experience of the pandemic in Australia differed from that of my friends and colleagues in this part of the world, like many of them, I wasn't able to collect empirical data during the, this time. Additionally, the pandemic prompted a pivotal change in my life when I made the decision to relocate to a new country and to join a, a different institution. Lastly, I accepted a leadership position dedicated to fostering the access, growth, and success of colleagues, staff, and students within a public institution, a position that sadly will disappear as the state government is in the process of rendering, rendering it illegal. As Facundo mentioned, consequently, many of the ideas that I will present today are not entirely new, as they were initially proposed in a book I wrote during the pandemic and published last year in Spanish. While these viewpoints may not be novel, uh, th this talk marks the first occasion where I discuss them in an English speaking setting. I'm particularly excited to discuss them with our Latinx colleagues. Therefore, the, the title of today's talk aligns with the title of the book, which, wa which was published in Mexico last year. If you are curious about the, the, the book or you wanna practice your Spanish, you can freely download uh, the, the book using this QR code. Finally, a third important element of today's talk and something essential to note is that nearly all the ideas I will present today have been shaped, developed, and grown through dialogues with numerous uh, amazing friends and colleagues. These friends not only share similar concerns, but also actively participate in collective explorations of potential answers to the questions at hand. They serve as a constant source of inspiration. And instead of standing in the shoulders of giants, I envision us in a theoretical scrum for those of you interested in, sport, in sports metaphors. Although I engage with many colleagues in this topic, I want to recognize this aid for their, for their exceptional contribution and inspiration. Not only are they world-class academics, but all of them uh, share roots with what is often referred as the global South, except one. But perhaps more importantly, they, kind, they are kind and generous people, something that is not common in academia in, in these days. So if I'm not presenting anything new, 
none of the ideas are solely mine. And I'd like empirical work to discuss with you. You may wonder why I'm here. So allow me to explain, if you kindly bear with me, that this talk aims to accomplish two goals. Firstly, to share a series of collective med meditations that I believe can serve as the seed of something greater. And secondly, to extend an invitation to all of you to embark on the next phase of this program. Should I successfully convince you of the potential of these meditations? At this point, I, I intentionally remain some, some somewhat vague as I prefer not to reveal my hand just yet. However, just a heads up, this talk will encompass elements of a pep talk, a manifesto, and a personal reflection. Although I will bring some examples of my empirical work pre and post pandemic, and this is perfectly acceptable because in my view, academia has the capacity to transcend established norms and embrace alternative forms of expression, uh, like, like for example, I mean, and I'm just realizing that I'm sharing it incorrectly. So if you just give me one second, I'm just gonna do it correctly, just to make sure that the slides bring all the power that I embedded them with. Um, just give me a second. Okay, so let's try this again. Okay, so for whatever reason, I don't think to be able to do it possible. So I'm just gonna come back to, to what we had uh, before. So I was saying, um, uh, academia has the, the capacity to transcend established norms and embrace alternative forms of expressions like I mean. And since I'm the season finale of Latinx digital media, I hope it's okay for you uh, that I bring some cliffhangers rather than a clear cut out at the end. I will employ meditations as a vehicle for conveying my ideas, or perhaps it will be more accurate to describe them as stories. Drawing inspiration from the wonderful work of Catherine McKitty, who asserts that stories have no answers. The stories offer an aesthetic relation relationality that relies on the dynamics of creating, narrating, listening, hearing, reading, and sometimes on hearing. So before proceeding further, it is necessary for me to briefly discuss my work in the last 20 years. And, and thank you, Facundo, for providing an overview. But I, I, just bear with me. I will promise it will be short. This serves not only to situate my knowledge, but also, I promise, to establish its relevance later in the talk. I believe that my unusual background has enabled me to appreciate different approaches to academia, and this forms part, this, this, this forms part of my forthcoming proposal. So allow me to outline the research I have conducted in the previous 20 years. At the core of my research lies ethnography as a fundamental epistemological approach. Throughout my uh, 20, year, 20 plus years of work, ethnography has been central, either in its explicit application as a method or as a source of inspiration for my thinking. While digital culture broadly defined has been the primary focus, my research extends beyond the domain to explore the broader impact of socio-technical systems. This perspective forms the foundation of my research interests, which can be visualized in, in this incomplete map encompassing theories, methods, and objects. While the map primarily engages with the disciplines indicated, it also engages in a meaningful dialogue with other fields such as visual art, urban studies, and human geography, among others. As Jonathan uh, Stern aptly describes, I consider myself an interdisciplinary scholar or more like um, uh, an Antidisciplinary scholar. Finally, my work is characterized by its, by its international scope. I have lived, studied, and or worked in Mexico, Canada, Spain, the UK, Australia, and currently in the, I am in the US. So it is collaboratively in nature and has commitment to uh, generating impact. Okay, great. Now that I have located my statements and presented my credentials, it is time to connect uh, and to commence the medita meditations. Following the academic tradition, a, a, a tradition that I'm trying to interpolate, following this academic tradition, I will introduce a white European man into the past, from the past into the stage. In the 17th century, the philosopher and, and mathematician René Descartes published his work, Meditations on First Philosophy. Although I will not delve into the, a detailed analysis of the content of his six meditations, I will borrow, adapt, and in a sense, 
following Osvalde Andrade cannibalized Descartes' methods and some of his questions to explore the study of digital media in Latin America. And this is the first lesson today. Important scholars from the past can also be used in non-traditional ways. We don't need to take them as face value. Descartes' meditations were primarily concerned with the fundamental question of how can we know? And how can we know that we know? By engaging in, in a process of radical doubt, questioning the existence of an external world and even of his own senses, Descartes aims to establish a foundation for knowledge. I'm sure you're all familiar with his famous dictum, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. In the meditations, Descartes embarks on a process of radical doubt to establish a foundation for knowledge. Meditations typically employ a systematic and introspective approach, and this approach has been central to my work since the onset of the pandemic. However, the distinguishing factor that I, is that I have undertaken these meditations collectively. With that in mind, allow me to share these four meditations to, to end with an invitation. While drawing inspiration from Descartes' methods, let us deviate from his own line of thinking and use, and use him for different purposes. We can commence by considering the notion of radical doubt and applying it to the realm of digital technologies. And for today's discussion, when referring to digital technologies, I will encompass various interdisciplinary aspects of digital culture, social media, digital networks, et cetera, et cetera. So the broader field of inquiry that surrounds them. That is, my focus will be on the interdisciplinary uh, area uh, of the study that we call digital media. We may start by scrutinizing the concepts that underpin the study and comprehension of digital culture. In the last 40 years, numerous conceptual frameworks have emerged to discuss new technologies, serving as the scaffolding of or under, of or, for or understanding of them. Exap ex examples of that include web 2.0, cyberspace, information society, platforms, algorithms, data, both big and small, uh, data colonialism, surveillance capitalism, influencers, content uh, creators, algorithmic power, black boxes, etc. just to name a few. The initial radical query that arises is, why do we employ these concepts and how effective they have been in the study of digital media in Latin America? Now, I invite you to envision that when I'm discussing the context of Latin America, yeah, you, 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 know, you can probably imagine something like this. But also, and this is very important, Latin America is also kind of like this. It's similar to this um, and similar to this. And this one is quite amusing and may benefit from a little bit of context. The image depicts an automated payment system at one of the electricity companies in Mexico. And humorously enough, the, status, the, the sign says, we don't have electricity or this. One potential answer lies in the fact that these concepts have been developed by eminent scholars to shed light on, on conceptually explicate light lived realities. Empirical evidence in their research or to distill complex phenomena into consigns and adaptable concepts. This process aligns with the tenets of scientific thinking as inaugurated by Descartes himself. However, in response to the second question, how useful they are to study digital technologies in Latin America, my answer is less definitive, and I perceive two inherent complications. The first one is that at times we lose sight of the distinction inadvertently reinforcing the reliance on concepts rather than critically examine them through empirical evidence. So what is first concept or evidence? When I initially embarked on researching uh, the internet and computer mediated communication, which dates to the previous century, I would inquire, inquire, for example, whether individuals felt a sense of belonging to virtual communities to which they respond, responded affirmatively. When I asked them to describe their virtual selves, their answers often conformed to their question posed. So this highlights a distinction between employing conceptual frameworks to guide our empirical work and using our field work to address, challenge, create new or discard uh, uh, concepts. Secondly, we tend to forget uh, uh, to challenge these concepts. In collaboration with my, co my colleague Harindranath Ramaswamy, we have explored the potential nature of these concepts and their entanglement with ethical and moral concerns. 
when studying digital media, these concepts tend to be overly technocentric and deterministic. Moreover, since they have originally prim primarily in the global north, they often reflect the lived realities of the context prevalent there. It has been assumed problematically that what unfolds in London, New York, or Los Angeles can serve uh, as universal archetypes of technology, technological practices, perhaps because it is assumed that the same technologies are ut utilized in Jalapa, Puerto Montt, or Cahuita, although we know that that's not entirely true. We should definitely spend more time reading rest of the world and, and spend less time reading Wire, uh, even if the director of the rest of the world is the daughter of a, a Google ex CEO, but let's not get into that for now. This prompts us the question, what remains excluded and overlooked by these concepts? And more importantly, how their establishment as dominant concept, conceptual frameworks have marginalized alternative epistemic genealogies with profound implications for politics and ecologies of knowledge because it affects our ability to understand and engage with experiences and practices that elude the grasp of mainstream concepts. As Catherine McKittrick again eloquently states, the logic of knowing to prove is unsustainable because incongruity appears to be offering a typical thinking, yet curiosity thrives. While there exists a long tradition and long-standing tradition of eminent thinkers, philosophers, and indigenous scholars who have long pondered these questions and intervened into what we can aptly call epistemic injustice, or even more accurately, epistemicide. The study of digital technologies has, in a more modest sense, remained somehow disconnected from these traditions and, this, and its associated literatures. This has perpetuated a dichotomy, a distinction between the global north and the global south, although not strictly limited to geographical boundaries. We all know that there are several souths within the north and several norths within the south. In the context of our discussion today, I believe the second mediation, meditation should revolve about dichotomies and concepts. Now, I do not claim expertise in philosophy or in Descartes' philosophy, but he holds relevance for other reasons as well. In his meditations, Descartes proposed the separation of the mind from the body, which is commonly known as, as uh, uh, Cartesian dualism. This separation, in a sense, inaugurates an idea deeply embedded in modernity, an idea that underpins scientific knowledge and often employs dualistic thinking. Modernity, as a concept, has faced criticism on multiple fronts, including a notable critique penned by another French scholar in this particular book. The question that arises is, is whether scientific knowledge is the sole form of knowledge, or even the most valuable one, Pertaining to our current meditation, this dualistic thinking represents one epistemological form among many, albeit a strong and influential one. There exist alternative epistemologies, such as various indigenous ways of knowing, that challenges this dualism. However, these epistemologies tend to render invisible or marginalized as mere folk wisdom relegated to the periphery of the true scientific inquiry. It is not coincidental that the scientific method, that the notion of replicability, which formed the foundation of scientific papers, for example, trace their origins back to the cards. Well, this platform is not, this conversation is not suitable for an extensive exposition of how contemporary academia is interconnected with this notion, which for example, solidifies in the ideas of canons, disciplines, methodological approaches, it suffices to acknowledge that privileging one form of knowledge has rendered other forms of, of knowledge uh, uh, invisible. There have been various thinkers who have put forward similar critiques. For today's discussion, I have chosen to bring the ideas of the Argentinian Mexican philosopher and Enrique Dussel to talk about the epistemologies of the South, mostly because I'm, avoid I'm avoiding the big professor and many people uh, uh, have written in on the same topic. And I'm pretty sure some of you know what I'm talking about. Throughout this extensive body, uh, throughout his extensive body of work, Dussel has critically examined Eurocentrism and the notion of modernity. As a response, he has introduced the concept of transmodernity. And the concept goes beyond a mere recovery of self valorization within the cultural moments or cultural moments. And when I say or, I, I mean Latin America that were marginalized by, by, by modernity. This also 
uh, this project also proposes the reclamation of values neglected by modernity, employing them as a starting points for a critique firmly ground in our hermeneutical possibilities. Dussel uh, suggests that individuals residing in the borders, as proposed by uh, Ansaldúa, are well suited to undertake this critique. These individuals, and I imagine some watching this presentation, possess a unique perspective and lived experiences that can contribute to a more comprehensive understanding of the subject matter. So what relevance does this hold for the study of digital media in Latin America? I would like to emphasize two points in this regard. Firstly, modern and scientific thinking tends to adopt a reductionist approach, breaking down phenomena into smaller controllable parts for study and explaining in depth only a small fraction of reality. However, there exist alternative epistemologies that embrace a more holistic and relational approach. And Latin America boasts a multitude of such epistemologies. We have now reached a, a juncture and comprehending the role of digital technologies in everyday life necessitates moving beyond some of the dichotomies we have previously relied upon. Online, offline, social, technological, local, global, all new, north and south, etc. So this imperative resonates with calls for a more fluid and flexible conceptualization. So allow me to provide an example derived from a small pilot study that I did about, about uh, what's up in Mexico. During this study, a young Mexican woman uh, from Michoacan residing in Mexico City and self-employed shared her experiences regarding family dynamics within a WhatsApp group. She recounted how her mother, a PhD in chemistry, consistently forwarded her forwarded her fake news to the group. Upon reflecting on why an educated woman would believe such information, the participant explained that her mother does not necessarily endorse those beliefs, but send them, sends them because uh, other family members request it, or because she knows they will find it amusing, or because uh, just to forward, that means that they are feeling her presence. Perhaps instead of framing these occurrences solely in terms of misinformation, fake news, and disinformation, we should theorize them in relation to affect or kinship. In examining WhatsApp as an example, it might be fruitful to approach this study through a, throughout a genealogy um, uh, lens that establishes connections with markets, plazas, and chismes, gossip, rather than focusing solely on, the, on its classification as a platform or a social media or a, or a chat messenger. This alternative perspective could provide a deeper understanding of its significance and impact within our cultures. Moreover, it is possible we should approach these digital practices in a more comprehensive manner, as I will revisit in the next meditation. The second point pertains to the vast body of, no of theoretical and conceptual work developed by Latin American scholars. While this work uh, receives considerable attention within Latin America. It is notably less referenced in studies focusing on digital technologies, particularly within mainstream English-speaking academia. In collaboration with my colleagues Ignacio Siles and Pablo Ricarte, both of them have been in this fantastic series, we have interrogated and intervened into this issue. On the one hand, we have actively engaged with Latinx and Latin American scholars such as Martin Barbero, Garcia Canclini, Fals Borda, Gloria Andalzúa, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, Arturo Escobar, and many more. On the other, we have taken seriously the theoretical resources that emerge from this scholar's thinking, but also tried to build upon them and develop our own. And for example, this idea of tensions, mediations, transversalities, and fluidities. We contend that these concepts could be more useful to explain our complex realities in part because they tend to be less rigid than dichotomies. So in summary, Dichotomies have played a fundamental role in shaping our knowledge and understanding of, of digital technologies from the outset. Concepts such as all new, virtual, real, access, non-access, online, offline, from the foundation, uh, have been at the foundation of entire theories concerning the digital realm. These theories have aimed to explain and illustrate the differences of, or similarities between two seemingly distinct and, other and often juxtaposed uh, elements. For instance, Common inquiries have revolved around the construction of online identities or the usage patterns of specific platforms among particular groups. What we need is a more relational approach that go beyond fixed and discrete objects. With this in mind, I invite you to embark on the third meditation concerning the device that I have been employed 
to address these inquiries and what has and, and that has to do with life itself. My own path to respond to these issues has been to shift the focus away from technologies themselves and instead observe and, and, and observe how different aspects of life are embraced and adapted in the digital sphere. Rather than reducing technologies to a series of concepts to be articulated and enacted in a place, in this case, Latin America, I propose understanding them in relation to life, that is, as vital forces. By transcending the current critique of concepts and comprehending the complex interplay between technologies, practices, cultures, histories, and people, we can view technologies as vital forms or integral components of life. This approach seeks to be generative and open-ended, fostering new perspectives and understandings. And throughout history, we have consistently considered life in relation to digital technologies. Initially, we perceived technologies as separate from real life, uh, for example, life on screen. We endeavor to decipher the characteristics of this life online or to describe the process of worldling in a second life. Our focus has shifted to contemplating how, the la how life unfolds in tandem with technologies, emphasizing the notion of a media life and even discussing life after new media. Finally, we are witnessing an emerging discussion about life without humans once AI takes command. So allow me to share the origin story of my fascination with technologies as vital forms. Several years ago, while residing in Australia, I became aware of a, of a disparity between the topics that dominated the mainstream discourses on the digital realm and my first handed experience using technology to connect with family and friends in Latin America. One striking example of this mismatch among others was the use of WhatsApp. There existed a stark contrast between its widespread adoption and utilization in certain countries and the lack of published studies on the application within Euro-American uh, literature. When I mentioned the possibility of, when I mentioned the possibility of, of writing a book in 2015 to a senior mentor, an esteemed academic cautioned me, this, this esteemed academic cautioned me by stating, that's not relevant. Nobody cares about WhatsApp. Don't waste your time. Admittedly, they were correct. WhatsApp had little to non-significant in the global north. However, in the south, it was swiftly becoming an emerging, uh, uh, an emerging as a quintessential app, serving as a crucial infrastructure for mobile communication. While delving into the reasons behind WhatsApp success is beyond the scope of this presentation, it may be a topic we can revisit in, in the Q&A uh, uh, session. What is crucial to note is that a couple of years later, Facebook launched a funding initiative for doing research on WhatsApp, awarding $1 million to Endeavor Worldwide primarily in the global South, but particularly to study misinformation. Again, concepts connected to uh, practices. Consequently, numerous research papers were published on WhatsApp, uh, including one by Pablo, which I strongly recommend, Pablo and Mora. Um, encouraged by these developments, I undertook a small scale pilot project in Mexico. I conducted interviews within, with 20 individuals from diverse backgrounds, inquiring about their usage of, the, what, of WhatsApp. However, what unfolded during these discussions went, went far beyond the mere uh, use of the app. Participants spoke about surviving in challenging economy, seeking employment opportunities, forging connections with family and friends, forming communities, providing mutual support, navig navigating romantic relationships, sharing resources, and, and, and becoming a grown uh, sense of anxiety. In essence, they share stories about life itself. Every time I probe into the material infrastructure of communication, their practices with the app, their imaginaries about the app, fears and daily routines with it, their responses were expansive, centering on family dynamics, interpersonal relationships, disappointments, innovative ways to use it, finding solutions to problems, etc. I asked them about technology, they replied about life. This begs the question, what does life with technologies truly means to us? In her memoir, The Empathy Diaries, Sherry Torkel interwines her personal narrative with her scholarly contributions. Towards the conclusion of the text, she asserts, technology makes us forget what we know about life, while it confronts us with the question of what we value most in life. This statement underscores an important distinction and Torkel emphasizes this point further 
to the, uh, the epilogue of the book, people are not objects. The core of Torkel's extensive body of work revolves not only on how computers change what people do, but how computers change what people are. So digital technologies have assumed uh, um, a pivotal role in um, numerous daily activities, often emerging as indispensable tools. Computers and cell phones have transcended their traditional roles as mere devices of communication or information retrieval and task manager, task, task management. They have evolved into multifaceted uh, platforms that facilitate social interaction, support educational endeavors, enable work-related tasks, foster new learning experiences, and cultivate interpersonal relationships. The significance of these technologies have been particularly pronounced in the context of the pandemic, where screens have seeming, seamlessly transformed into virtual classrooms, social gathering spaces, offices, theaters, gyms, dance floors, places of worship, and even funeral homes. Digital technologies have permeated every facet of life, enabling individuals to carry out an, ex an extensive array of tasks ranging from remote work and online learning, what we're doing right here right now, to maintaining connections with loved ones, seeking entertainment, sex, romance, participating in politics, uh, bullying and, and, and buying and saying things, legal and illegal, and a long, long, etc. The pandemic brought to the forefront the essential role played by digital technologies in our lives. It shed light to the under, undeniable reality. While these technologies are indispensable for all individuals, not everyone has equal access to them, nor they can fully harness their potential. Moreover, it is crucial to acknowledge that different individuals engage with diverse technologies leading to, a, to a varying levels of vitality within what Pablo calls the digital environment. Not all technologies possess the same level of significance, nor they do possess the same capacities to generate that significance. Considering this complexity, how can we comprehend technologies as integral components of a web that gives rise to, bit, to vital forms? Perhaps by decentering technologies and exploring how computational processes or algorithmic logics generate new forms of, of vitality. I have been employing this concept of vital technologies to delve into this inquiry. According to the various English dictionaries, vital has three meanings, something that is necessary or of, of utmost importance for the success or continued existence of, existence of something characterized by energy or related to life. When examining vitality in the context of technologies, the definition becomes particularly useful or it encompasses the three aspects of the concept. And interestingly enough, while well, I was just like putting together this slide, doing a screenshot of, of Google, I found another uh, archaic uh, definition, which is actually the opposite, which is fatal. And, I, and I'm, I'm so keen to explore that further. What propels the concept of vitality is the question of how technologies articulate, shape, and become part of the ways in which individuals exist and interact with the world through their daily usage. By adopting a perspective that embraces vitality, we can explore the multifaceted uh, questions that arise extended, extending beyond the boundaries of technologies itself. It becomes a political project. The concept of vital technologies transcends more normative, mere normative or descriptive dimensions. It represents a profound and ambitious intervention in shaping or reflections, studies, research, and relationships with, relationship with technologies. Recognizing technologies as vital necessitates the use of specific tools and situating them within broader spheres encompassing the discursive, political, historical, and beyond their isolated and momentary uses. So by highlighting the significance of technologies as vital forms, my aim, to, my aim is to contribute to a collective reflection that is both critical and activist in nature. This reflection extends beyond the boundaries of academia and becomes social, civic, political, ethical, economic, ecological, reflexive, collective, aesthetic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in order for us to do that, more people need to be involved. So in this final meditation, and I know that I'm just running against the clock, I delve into the imperative of constructing theories of digital uh, technologies that emerge from Latin America and speaks directly to Latin America. This does not imply exclusion from Latinx communities, for example, in the US or elsewhere. Rather, 
It emphasizes the need for theories that genuinely represent and resonate with our experiences. It is time to emphasize the ethical, social, and political necessity of transcending established beliefs, exploring alternative ways of knowing and living, incorporating diverse vocabularies into the conversation, and embracing the insights offered by other epistemologies. This process involves acknowledging and, en and, en and engaging with the diversity of digital experiences and the coexistence of digital forms uh, in a way to, uh, to a transmodern approach to digital technologies. Particularly present in an era where life courses through second order infrastructures controlled by, by profit driven corporations, the centering the project of te from technologies and concepts can illuminate the stark disparity between the techno capitalist agenda and the tumultuous and unpredictable nature of everyday life that characterizes Latin America and can potentially become a mobilizing force for alternative pathways. It could lead to the development of liberation technologies or technologies of hope just to connect uh, with two uh, um, great thinkers in Latin America. Merely bringing uh, a critical or, a, or a appealing to all notions of objectivity no longer suffices. The cards is not fashionable anymore. It is time for epistemic radicalism, a return to all roots and, to, and a call to activism. And this talk in a way is part of that conversation. While the cards focuses on ways of knowing, my primary interest now lies in ways of living. As an ethnographer, I'm acutely aware of this fundamental distinction. Knowledge is always situated and embodied within specific historical, geographical, and epistemic uh, uh, context. And in this era of AI, climate crisis, forced migrations, we need more than ever to ask better questions to provide other kinds of answers. We need to stop breaking things, even if that means going slower. So Latin American intellectual tradition has made notable contributions uh, to these adaptations and tactics, diligently documenting the dynamics and inventive manifestations through a concept such as hybrid cultures, mediations, buen vivir, and examination of subaltern experiences. It is imperative that we derive inspiration from these theoretical frameworks, but also take them further. Recall the senior colleague who advised me to abandon my research on WhatsApp, deeming it in irrelevant, I initially considered following their counsel. I actually didn't write that book. Assuming they're possessed in superior insights. However, this assumption proved incorrect. No one possesses a more comprehensive understanding of our realities than ourselves. So when interacting with colleagues from the global north, we often tend, as Latin American scholars, we often tend to adopt submissive and complacent roles. Some of these colleagues in the global north, whether intentionally or unintentionally, may even position us as subalterns misspell our names in publications, misrepresent our institutions or countries in conference introductions, neglecting to read or cite our work, and subjecting us to a greater challenges in publishing uh, compared to our colleagues. To counterbalance this dynamic, we must forge epistemic paths towards liberation, hope, and communality. This ultimately is the invitation and the true objective of my presentation today, and I'm just going to spend five minutes talking about that. So the key elements of the four meditations that I share with you, we have studied digital technologies that are inspired by theoretical and conceptual developments originated in the global north. However, when applied in the global south, they often fail to adequately capture the transmodern realities of these regions. The phenomenon that we have humorously called as tropicalization of theories, and especially issue we are editing at the moment, highlights the need for scholars interested in Latinx and Latin American cultures to explore alternative epistemic geographies and approaches. These approaches should not be considered the genealogies of thinking, should, should only, sorry, consider the genealogies of thinking and feeling as exemplified by Escobar's concept of sentipensar, but also actively engage with and contribute to a diverse body of, uh, of literature that originates beyond the confines of the global north. Not only um, uh, Latin America, but also Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, etc. Fortunately, much of this literature has been translated into English. My own focus is primarily on Latin America as a starting point of this endeavor. Now, you may be wondering, how can we practically implement these ideas? And I will end with four suggestions. The first one is that we need to expand our theoretical horizons. We must actively engage with the works of Black, Indigenous, feminist, and queer scholars as they have pioneered inclusive theories that hold the potential to foster liberation and hope. 
it is essential to prioritize their voices in our readings and research endeavors and also in our society. We have to be more inclusive in our studies. It is of almost importance to prioritize the studies of digital technologies that consider the populations and territories that may be more vulnerable to their impacts. We must engage in empirical, historical, and critical research with indigenous peoples, laborers, domestic workers, refugees, marginalized populations. This research should not only stem from a political standpoint, but also serve as a strategy to develop research that provides original empirical data. And by doing so, we can also identify the limitations and shortcomings of theories developed in other contexts. Certain problems that are specific to Latin America and the, and, the, and the everyday strategies used to navigate them should be central to our thinking about uh, digital technologies. This is something that I'm writing at the moment with uh, Dominique uh, Montiel. Allowing us to connect with, this, with, with conceptual genealogies developed in the region, for example, the study of the popular. What if we like to construct theories of the digital grounded in experiences using Rappi or Mercado Libre, Kabak, Shane, Alibaba, or others, rather than focusing on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. My proposal is not to isolate ourselves from the world, but rather to reestablish active engagement with the world as genuine participants. I'm certain that some of you have encountered this experience when receiving a blind review that poses the question, why Mexico, why Ecuador? A question that I can assure you researchers conducting fieldwork in Chicago or London will never have. Finally, we also need to be more innovative in our methodology, something that I can probably expand on the Q&A. So this is not a call for us to become more parochial or isolated. On the contrary, it is a call of arms to engage in conversations as equals. So I will not end with the cards, but I will end with Dussel again. When he says a project of this scope requires tenacity, time, intelligence, research, and solidarity. It requires a long-term maturation of new response in cultural resistance, not only to the elites of other cultures, particularly those that are dominant, but also against the Eurocentrism in elites in peripheral, colonial, and fundamentalist uh, cultures. Thank you. I'll just leave it like this. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, Pablo, could you please uh, make me co-host again so I can um, restart my video, please? <clears throat> you should be okay by now, Facundo. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, Edgar. Um, would, would you mind like, oh yeah, thank you. Uh, I will ask, oh, thank you very much for this very, very insightful, um, that's a great uh, end of the season finale as, as, the, uh, as you mentioned it. Um, I would like to remind the audience to they, they can ask any questions using the we I, I'm seeing that there already are a couple of questions there, but feel free to to answer those questions. I will moderate, but I will start with asking one um, by myself. Um, so you started talking about your position as an ethnographer, or how like you've been like you have been like building all of this knowledge uh, from this particular epistemic position and, and, and methods that call is uh, uh, within the ethnography. Um, my question is, how do you see uh, in a context within the field of communication and media studies which, that has been increasingly uh, had a sort of like behavioral turn in some way, uh, which can have like this, uh, that can suppose this concept that you were referring about like, having a dichotomous way of thinking about processes, thinking about the outcomes instead of like the processes. So my question is like in this context, in the field, what are the bridges, how we can have like these two words having like a conversation? Where are the spaces in which like these two ideas or like thinking more of the process instead of like the outcomes and the dichotomies, what are the spaces that you, you may recommend to start like having these conversations and creating those bridges. Yeah, thank you for the for the question, Akundo. I think the first thing that I need to mention about that is that um, I, my undergrad, my undergrad is in communication, but then I just kind of like slip away from communication, and I've always been, you know, playing in and out, and and I have nothing but respect and love for communication studies, media studies. 
But I also think that sometimes we tend to be so, um, and I include myself in this, we tend to be so invested in forming a discipline, kind of like showing the boundaries, this is what we do, that we tend to forget that perhaps that's our biggest strength. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what uh, ways would say as uh, post-discipline. We are potentially more, we, we, we potentially have more freedom than other disciplines. And the reason why I'm saying this is because um, I think that the, the canon of communication is still very much information. And I'm pretty sure many of my colleagues will disagree with this idea. But I also see this as a possibility for us to bring other ideas, other approaches. And I think in a way what you, the question that you asked was already your answer. For me, the two things that have saved me and allow me to build bridges to, with other disciplines, with other literatures, with other approaches has been on the one hand, the methodology, uh, the method, ethnography, which is always to talk to people and bring uh, people's ideas into the in, into the front, and the other one has been uh, to always have this particular doubt about everything. I, I admire several hundreds of scholars, but I never feel that that's you know I should follow this or I should follow that. So that's I think, and finally the centering also the idea of like what I'm doing is a research about a platform, for example. What I do is research about WhatsApp. That's not what I do. What I do is research about how people engage with technologies in society, right? And sometimes I use WhatsApp, sometimes I use digital photography, sometimes I use algorithms. It depends on what I'm trying to answer. And it frees you, it gives you a lot of vertigo because you don't know, it's like, so am I supposed to read everything? And that's, that gives you vertigo rather than these are the 25 uh, papers that you should read if you want to understand this issue. Um, but on the other hand, it allows you to just move to different directions. And I'll just give you an example. I explore photographically, visually one question, and then the result, I ended engaging with uh, cultural geography literature, and I published that in a cultural geography pa uh, paper. But then again, the problem becomes when, you know, your discipline or your association or whatever sets the boundaries. It's like, oh, you know, if you're in communication, you cannot publish this in, a, in this kind of journal or you cannot attend this conference, et cetera. So, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's also a political um, 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 quest. Yeah, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, we have one question from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, Silvia says, uh, regarding the rise of artificial intelligence in media, and all the, uh, this buzz around the use of large language models such, such as ChatGPT and my journey. Do you have any reflections about these kind of technologies from a Latin American perspective? So just so the audience knows, Silvia uh, Del Ben Furtado is a fantastic PhD here at the University of Texas, and she's doing a fantastic work on uh, algorithms and, and data and artificial intelligence in newsrooms in Latin America. So follow her work. Um, I don't think I have an answer to that, but I think I do have a question, which is like, should we be thinking about those terms mostly because the literature and the mainstream media talks about this as the next uh, frontier? Because we tend, to we tend to think about starting technologies as always the, the latest, thing. the most important thing is always the latest thing. And right now it's artificial intelligence and ChatGPT and lar large uh, uh, language models. But I would, I would probably counterbalance that question with another question, which is like, is this what we should be putting our efforts in understanding at the moment? Or there are more pressing issues? And I don't have the answer to that. And I guess all of us will have our own answer. But I, but I, but I don't want to, you know, respond, this is the last frontier, because it's, it's always changing. And I've been in this enough time to know that the last frontier is always like coming and coming and coming, but at the same time, it's also coming back, you know? So um, when I started studying digital photography was because 
it was an old technology and suddenly it became like the latest thing and everybody was doing research about selfies, et cetera. The same happened with WhatsApp and the same happened with so many different um, objects. So my suggestion, and this is like the teachable moment for Sylvia and for any student who's like still in the process of like finding their object, try to decenter your idea about I'm studying a technology and try to think about I'm studying, I'm, I'm studying processes, I'm studying uh, lineages, I'm studying practices rather than technologies. Fascinating answer. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Tomas. Uh, he says, thanks for the fascinating talk. I really appreciate your call to evaluate misinformation, not as deficit, but as an effect. For example, chisme. However, I wonder why we should stop at Latin America. Shouldn't we study alternate epistemologies effectively worldwide? Do you think these approaches are especially valuable in the, specific, in the specificity of the region or that the region can evoke more interest in studies of tech globally? Yeah, I think, I think this is a fantastic question. And, and um, yeah, for sure, we should expand our horizons. I, we need to read our African counterparts or African colleagues. We need to read um, what is coming from India, which is a, a huge tech hub. We should be reading what is happening in places like Indonesia. And, and again, I come, I come back to this idea of WhatsApp because it has allowed me to uh, underscore all these issues. Like the, the uses of, of um, WhatsApp are, are probably closer in Indonesia and in Mexico than they are like in Mexico or like in, in the UK and Sweden, right? Um, so yes, we need to engage with that. But the other part of the question, I think it's, it's more relevant, which is, it is not a matter of like, oh, you know, let's negate. It's, this is not about cultural imperialism of the seventies. This is about, okay, this idea of misinformation. Okay, what is the origin of this idea? Let's, 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 let's open the black box of the concept and realize what the concept is trying to do. Do we feel that that concept fully engages with the practices of families in Mexico who are just sharing stupid jokes just to keep the conversation flowing? Is that really misinformation or perhaps it's something else? Again, I don't have the answer, but when we do things empirically, rather than just say, oh, I'm studying misinformation in WhatsApp, why not to study? I'm studying how families engage with the flow of communication or the flow of information. And if that leads you to reinforce or use the concept of misinformation as, oh, you know what, this, is, this concept is really useful, I'm gonna use it. Because what, allows you, what that allows you as well is to break the concept. It's like, you know what, this concept of misinformation is really useful for this particular element, but I'm seeing this other element. And rather than saying, oh, this is not important because it doesn't fit with misinformation, it's like, what kind of conceptual work should I do in order for me to make sense of this? And therefore you make the concept, let's say misinformation grow and, and see the limits of the concept rather than just taking it as, as face value. Thank you, Edgar. So we have two more questions um, in order to address them. Uh, if you can uh, maybe, um, yeah, shorten the, the answer uh, so we have time for all of them. So Mariela says, uh, this was a great presentation, a set of meditations. I was wondering if you can speak a bit on how you take these meditations and posi uh, positionalities to the classroom, particularly how can the American theories of vital technologies and epistemologies, epistemologies can help us design interactive classroom activities? Wow. And you, and you expect me to, to answer that quickly? Uh, I wish I could. Uh, what I can tell you, Mariela, and thank you for your question. What I can tell you is that I'm teaching at the moment a class, and actually Sylvia was my student, um, called uh, Ethnography and Social Technical Futures, in which we try to break this notion of like, we're studying technology. We're studying social technical systems and the idea of futures that moves us into, into the space of the imaginaries. And that has allowed us, I think, hopefully, maybe, to interrogate all these issues in a more holistic way. So that's 
I see that connection. I see that clear connection. But I think ethnography, in a way, does that anyway. Uh, you, you cannot be reductionist when you do ethnography. I, I, on the contrary, you try to be expansive. So for me, ethnography has become like a, a, a very important tool to, to do that. Thank you. Uh, I invite you to continue the conversation outside the, <laughs> the, the seminar. Um, we have the last question from Lucia Mahitz Weinberg. Uh, this call to arms feels even more urgent in regards to the lives of the youth, given that 95% of children and adolescents grow up in majority war. And in my own bias, she said, as a developmental scientist. As we move to push for regulation of big tech based on, a need, on need and realities of the US and Europe, what global experiences of youth are we are forgetting or erasing? I mean, uh, I, again, I don't have an answer, but I but I remember a, a piece that I read about uh, an ethnographic piece that I read with fieldwork in uh, uh, indigenous community in Chiapas in Mexico, and the author that sorry I, it slips my mind right now. What the author was saying is that the youth in this um, community is actually helping their elders to learn how to use WhatsApp and mobile phones, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we also tend to be, um, the moral panic always triggers in, or it's always or default situation, right? It's like, oh, what is gonna happen with this or what's gonna happen with that? And, and while I'm not saying technologies or the implementation of technologies don't have impact. And most of the time, or in many occasions, this impact is um, uh, um, negative. I also think that, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you know this as, as an expert on development, we also need to learn what works for us. What kind of technologies have been useful for us? What kind of situations we have engaged with in our particular field works, in our particular communities, that are actually um, helping communities to thrive with technologies. And for example, Paola Ricarte is, is someone who knows more about this. And she's, she has been doing a lot of work uh, both with indigenous communities in Mexico and with feminist uh, scholars in Mexico and feminist activists. So perhaps she will be a, a, a better uh, a reference for me to, to just to, to give you. Thank you very much, Edgar, for a phenomenal seminar, a great way, as, as, as Facundo said, to wrap up the academic year for us, the third academic year. Thank you, Facundo, for standing moderation. Thank you, our audience, for amazing questions and for staying with us through the end. This concludes our speaker series for the year, so I want to wish everybody uh, who's in the Northern Hemisphere, a great summer. Everybody who's in the Southern Hemisphere, a great winter. Uh, perhaps not as fun as summer, but still a great winter. And uh, we will see you all when we resume the fourth uh, year of this virtual seminar series. Once again, Edgar, spectacular. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Facundo uh, uh, and Pablo, for inviting me. Bye now.